good morning. How are you today? Hope you're having a uh, wonderful Memorial Day weekend. I uh, was thinking this week about the first time I made this particular mistake. Yeah, uh, it's it's not that it's not that big of a. I mean, it's a, well anyway. Uh, <laughs> no, you're gonna you're gonna laugh at the silliness of it probably. But here's the thing. So uh, I grew up a fan of music. I grew up playing music, and uh, not only did I enjoy playing uh, music in live settings and writing songs with friends and doing all that sort of thing, but just as a music fan, I've I've gone to my fair share of concerts. I've I've gone to concerts at churches and stadiums and seen bands none of y'all have heard of and seen some that you might have heard of over the years. I just It's something I've enjoyed doing. But one of the things that I, I learned very quickly, the first time I ever went uh, to a, a more local concert in a small venue, was I'll never forget that I, I walked in and I really liked the band that I was going to see and I, I had their t-shirt on. Okay, I had their t-shirt on, proudly displaying my fandom, as we say these days, of this particular group. And I met up with one of my friends somewhere in the little venue or whatever, and they gave a look at my shirt, and they looked at my face, and they looked at my shirt again, and they just did one of these, and they said, don't be that guy. And I said, what now? So you don't know? It's a rule. You don't ever wear the shirt of the band that you're about to see at their own concert. And I was like, what? Turns out that in some genres of music, this is an unwritten rule that you're not supposed to break. I'm pretty sure it's a movie quote from somewhere. But it's like not cool to show how big of a fan you are of the band that you're going to go see, even though you're a fan of the band that you're going to go see. Now, as I got older, I didn't care about this rule, and, you know, here's the funny thing about this rule, by the way. Every band you go see, no matter how, like, local or how nationally renowned they are, they all have the merch table set up. You can get a bumper sticker to slap on the back of your vehicle or on your guitar case if you're a fellow musician. You can wear their t-shirt proudly, and you can, and trust me, I have, you can get their CD for... For kids in the room, a CD is this small, <laughs> I'm just kidding, <laughs> you put it in, you can only listen to like 13 songs instead of all the songs like you can today. But anyway, uh, I would get that, you know, get their CD or their record. Anyway, in a car, you could put the CD in and you can roll your windows down if it's a nice day and you can crank the music up and you can sing to the top of your lungs and you can let everyone know how much you love listening to this particular music. Which, by the way, when I was in college, I loved to do that. I wanted everyone to hear the music that I liked. Which, by the way, is why you wear the shirt of the band that you like. Because you want other people to hear the thing that you think is good. We do that, though, all the time. Uh, We don't realize it, but we're walking, talking, marketing people, even if you don't want to be. Like, I was talking to Nathan this morning. I found out that if you, uh, like, are a construction-type person, there are particular brands of drills and saws that you should not walk into the construction area with, or you'll be ridiculed for having the wrong brand. I can see some of you nodding along to that, so that's true. I know, like, if you want to be the gruff and tough, you know, guy, you got to wear your Carhartt stuff. Uh Uh-huh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're a fan of a favorite team, you wear your favorite team stuff. I've told you before, I love nothing better than to find someone wearing a Reds or a Bengals shirt or hat and going up and either saying who day to them for the Bengals or just go Reds if it's a red thing, and they think that I'm weird because it's like, did you just track me down in the grocery store to tell me that? Like, I didn't even know I put this shirt on today. So we all do this on some level, even if we don't think we do. 
We, we, we want people to know what we're about. We want people to know what we like, what we dislike. We want people to know what we are for. Which is funny because at the end of June, we're going to do four Markle anyway. You should sign up. But that's neither here nor there. I didn't even mean to do that. That was a marketing ploy too. Um, we, we like to do this, and, and it's, we've grown accustomed to it. And it's, it's not surprising that when we read our passage we've been looking at in Deuteronomy chapter 6, the Shema, that the last two verses of the section we've been looking at are a call to the people of God, the Israelites, to physically wear what it is that they're about. Now, of course, as we're going to see in a moment, the call to physically wear what they're about might not be such a literal call as much as a signifier to always keep in front of you what God is calling you to do and who he's calling you to be. But of course, as time went on and the time of Jesus, we found out that the Jewish people did very much take this literally and begin to wear uh, what they are called to wear in this passage. And we'll look at that here in just a moment. But what I want to do today, even though we're going to highlight two verses, verses 8 and 9 of Deuteronomy chapter 6, I'm going to read the entire passage that we've been looking at for this month. Because I want us to capture what's in verses 8 and 9 in the context of the whole today. So if you would, please, follow along with me as we read Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel... The Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand and fix them as an emblem on your forehead and write them on the doorposts of your house." And on your gates. Now, after this passage, Moses will then deliver the warnings of not heeding the advice or the command of this particular passage. And this passage, as we said, is called the Shema because it is named that because of the first words of the passage Hear, O Israel. The people are expected to hear the words that are coming and then abide by them and to live by them. And they are told not only to abide by those words, but the words that they point to, which is the whole of the commands of God and the way of life that he's calling the people to. They are to love the Lord their God with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their might. We know that this call to live in this obedient way Uh, was not only for the Israelites that first heard the message, but for all people that ever want to live a life devoted to God. Jesus called this the greatest command when he was questioned by the legal experts at the time about what were the greatest commandments. And then not only that, but we're told that it is so important and so imperative to live this out that we're supposed to pass on the teaching and the commands and the way of life that the people of God live to the generations that come after us, to our children and their children and so on and so forth. And we're supposed to do that in a thorough manner. That when you are going, when you are rising, when you're going to bed, when you're about your entire life, everything that you do and breathe should be about passing this way of life along. And when we get to verses 8 and 9, the Israelites are told to tie them on the wrist, the forearms, and to wear them on the forehead. And for the record, in, in the Hebrew, it's, it's not just the forehead. It more specifically means between the eyes. And you might be wondering, well, why would this sort of imagery be given to the people? Well, if something is at the center of your head or if it's on your arms, 
It's ever-present. When something is literally between your eyes, it not only should be a focus for you, but a focus for anybody else that is seeing you. And when you bind them to your forearms, it is ever-present when you're about your work, when you're doing the day-to-day labor of life. The Scripture is there. Now, we know that, historically speaking, at the time of Jesus, the Jewish people took this passage and they created these little boxes with little parchment, little scrolls that had passages of Scripture. They're called teflon or phylacteries. And these boxes would be adhered to uh, the wrappings that could go on the forearm or to a band that was around the forehead so that this passage, when it says to bind them to the forearms and keep them in the, between your eyes, could be taken literally with little pieces of Scripture that probably were so small that you had to have some sort of special device to even read them. But that wasn't the point. The point was to be able to walk around and show everyone that you've got the Scripture attached to your head and to your forearms. Of course, Jesus ridicules this in his teaching because though the people bound them to their forearms or to their heads, <laughs> they weren't living out with all heart, soul, and might. It was taking what was literal and missing the heart of the passage. But not only that, we're, we're told that it goes beyond the individual because They're also told to post the scripture, the word of God on the doorposts. And if you remember in this world, and even in the time of Jesus, as time moves on, uh, the notion of the single family home didn't exist. So multiple generations lived under one roof, and the communities were tightly gathered together. And so if you adhered to this principle, and you put the word of God on the doorposts, it was not just for you to see, but for everybody to see. Anybody that came near your home knew what you were about if you adhered to this command. And it's an interesting command to end this particular passage, this Shema, with. Because the reality is is that we don't often think about keeping what we are called to live by within our sight and within arm's length. Even though we do that in every other facet of life that we can think of. For instance, in this day and age, if you have a smart device and you don't know how to get somewhere, first of all, you can put a, an appointment on your calendar and put precisely where you need to be at and when you need to be there. And if you pull your phone out and you get in the car, you can just pull up your calendar and click the meeting that you need to be at and it'll automatically populate in your map and tell you exactly where to go and it'll tell you how quickly you will get there. We know how to set ourselves up to be able to navigate the way. And we love to tell people about it, too. We love to tell people uh, the things that we do and the things that we like and the places that we're going. And, and, you know, there are even people now that uh, have made an entire market on productivity. They will tell you how to use your calendar so that you can shave off time so that you don't have to think about where you need to be because it's always within eyesight. And by the way, I'm very, very meticulous. Like with my own calendar, it's kind of weird. But then I don't have to remember an appointment and be like, oh my gosh, where do I got to be? Anyway. And so when we look at this passage in the whole context and the call to live out our faith with heart, soul, and mind, it shouldn't be surprising that we're commanded to do something 
that will keep the commands of God at our, our, at our arm's length and with an eyesight at all times. Because if we don't, we will easily forget what we're about, who we're supposed to be, where we're going, and how we're going to get there. And that's ultimately what the Shema is about. It's the call to attention to recognize that God's way and God's design for our lives is the way to go. And that should be the thing that we are most excited about heading toward and most excited about sharing with other people. Whether we use our modern tools to figure out all the things we need to figure out or whether we wear a shirt with our favorite brand or our favorite team or our favorite band in order to show everybody what we're about and what we like at all times. And yet, for some reason, we don't tend to do this with our faith. There's something about us that feels maybe like we're wrong-headed if we move our faith and our calling to the forefront in the same way that we do everything else. You know, it's funny, uh, when I left my previous church, I was given a... Uh, a bobblehead of myself. And I got a little nervous when I first got it because uh, they, they made it, uh, I'm holding a guitar and the, bobble, the bobblehead me is holding my guitar and it's got a Bengals t-shirt but then they put a Bible with it and I was like, oh good. Somebody knows that about me. Because I know sometimes if you get to know me and we're shooting the breeze, it's easy for me to tell you all the different things I'm about and not bring up the number one thing <laughs> that I'm about. I'm human too. And by the way, I'm not suggesting that you throw out all of your favorite shirts and all your favorite brands and everything and just wear things that say Jesus on it all the time. I mean, you can do that if you want to. But I'm going to go deeper with this. And it brings me to a conversation that I had years ago. Angie and I were out to dinner with some friends, I think at an Italian restaurant. And somehow we came to the topic of our practice of studying our faith, more precisely of reading the Bible regularly. And despite the fact that I consider myself a Bible geek, at the time I really had this kind of wayward notion that if I was too regimented about my daily Bible reading, that it somehow would be deemed inauthentic. It needed to be more organic. I needed to do it when my heart was really into it. And you know, when you treat things that flimsy, do you know what tends to happen? You don't do them. And our, our friend was, was talking to us about what she does. And, and she said, well, she said, I pretty much make sure that I have a Bible reading every day, whether it's a chapter or three chapters a day to get through in a year. And then she said something that I have not forgotten and that immediately, I'm, I'm talking immediately, like the day after I started something that I have not stopped since then. She said, you know, I have found that if I put myself in reading the scripture on a daily basis, there will be days where I will be half asleep when I'm reading. There will be days where I've had a bad day and my heart won't be into it. And then there will be days where I'm really excited and I'm hyper-focused on what I'm reading and on those hyper-focused days, I'm going to remember every single word after I've read it. In fact, I'll be reading it so closely that I might be reading a chapter that I've read before, and yet it'll feel like the first time I've ever read it before, because something new or something I hadn't noticed stood out to me. And then on those days where I'm not at my best, 
I may do it, and it might feel like I'm just checking off a box. But if I commit to that day in and day out, eventually I'll come back to the passage that I just checked the box on, and the next time I come around to it, I will be at my best, and I will read it anew as if I had never read it before, and something will jump out to me. And then the next day when I'm not at my best, and the thing that jumped out to me the year before, I might gloss over. But no matter what, I'm always setting myself up to be open to hearing what God has to say to me on that day and every day thereafter. And I went home, and the next day, I got that Bible app. Any of you have that on your phone? And I found one of those year-long Bible plans, and I've just done one every single year. And here's confession time. Sometimes I miss days. Some of you are like connected on me, so you, you see if I'm trying to catch up. You can, you can make comments to me if you ever want to. I appreciate ridicule. Sometimes I'm not always present. Sometimes I'm just trying to get it done. And then other days, like just this last week, I've been reading through Jeremiah And I had this moment where I was reading about the Babylonian captivity and the fact that the people would hear Jeremiah's words and then they would say, this person's nonsense. He's not speaking for God. In fact, if we listen to him, it's going to lead to our destruction, even though he's claiming that it'll lead uh, to our good fortune if we heed to his words. And of course, Jeremiah, being the prophet of God, was right, and they were wrong, and it ended up not going so well for them. And the epiphany that I had when I was reading these chapters was, oh my word, this feels like today. Because there's always going to be someone somewhere to try to tell you that the word of God isn't what it is and that you should go this other direction and that will appear at a time to be leading to good fortune but it will ultimately lead to calamity. In fact, it's the story all the way back in the garden when the serpent says, did God really say that you will die if you eat the fruit that he told you not to eat? And we've been playing that game ever since, haven't we? Hence the reason that God in his infinite wisdom not only calls the people to live for him with all heart, soul, and mind, but tells them to do things that might feel extreme, but will keep them tethered to his word at all times. Because he knows that we daily need to be in step with him at every step of our journey. Otherwise, we could very easily go off track. And for me, that's just one way that I keep my faith at the forefront, by making sure that I am daily in the Scripture. And I'll tell you, it's hard. I know, like, you get into Leviticus every year, and you want to throw in the towel. There's only so many times that you can get crossed up over which sacrifices and which pigeons and doves and things like that to make before you gloss over But I encourage you, it's okay if you have a day where you gloss over. Just stick with it. The same is true with prayer. I don't know what your prayer rhythm might be. You know, the early church, they kept to the prayer times of the Jewish faith that they came out of. So we know that there was a morning, an afternoon, and an evening prayer time. And it not only was an independent personal prayer, but sometimes they went to the synagogue or to the community and prayed together. But they practice this three times a day prayer. Maybe you do something like that or maybe you have your own rhythm. But I can guarantee you, whatever your rhythm is, you've probably fallen asleep praying at night. Which is okay. You know? And you probably had moments where you were in desperate need of God's wisdom and God's care. 
and you couldn't stop praying, and you were definitely in the moment. I've had those. But here's the thing, whatever it is, I encourage you, especially in our modern day, where we have a whole lot of tools in our life to distract us, to use them not as distractions, but as methods to keep God's word and the life God calls you to at the forefront. Yes, I'm encouraging you, use your phone, get a Bible plan and set a reminder to tell you to read it every day. It doesn't make you a bad person of faith if you stick to a rhythm of life. In fact, you can even use an app to remind you to pray. That's good too. But here's the point of it all. And this is what I want us to leave the Shema with. The purpose of this was not to do what the people at the time of Jesus did with it. Not to just set up visible reminders so that you could show everyone what you were about when you might not have really been about it in the first place. It wasn't just for a show of religion. It was to keep God's word and his rule for life at the forefront of everything that you do at all times. So what I'm not encouraging you to do is to set your reminders and your plans and all the things for everybody else to see when in reality you don't do them. But instead to say, hey, I have a means and a way of life that we live in where I can adhere to the heart of this passage, this call to live out God's word with all heart, soul, and mind at all times. Because here's the truth. What we wear on our sleeve, we bear for all to see. What we wear on our sleeve, we bear for all to see. If you want to pass on the faith, if you want to have a robust faith for yourself, if you want to commit to what God has called us to, then you have to be all in. You have to wear it on your sleeve, which is our modern way of saying that you let everyone else see what's on the inside flowing out. We often say we wear our emotions on our sleeve. The God life that we are called to by the grace of God through Jesus, by the power of the Spirit, was not meant to just be a private faith And it also wasn't just meant to be a public show of religiosity and piety that didn't have a real core from within. It was meant to be a both and. When the the scripture calls us to live with heart, soul, and might, it means that our whole being is devoted to God. And not just our whole being, but to pass the light and life that God gives on to everybody else. And you can only do that if you wear it on your sleeve. And that's what the Shema is all about. Now, as we move on this year, starting next week, we're going to go into the book of Revelation, which I had a couple people that have asked me about that book being done here. So we're going to do it. We're going to dive into it. And and the reason is, is because it's easy to look at these commands and say, well, that's great to live that out. But what's the point? Because it's so hard and this world makes it so difficult to stay tethered to God. But there's a message in that book, the voice of John, exiled on the island of Patmos, to call the churches back to their first love, to know that behind the curtain of this world, there's a spiritual reality. And while it is difficult to live out our faith because the world may be antagonistic about it, there is good news because God wins in the end through his son, Jesus. And so this call to live with heart, soul, and might is worth it 
Because even if it's hard now, we get to share in the victory of God in the end. And that's where we'll be headed next week. But before we get there, I hope that you grabbed a communion packet this morning on your way in. We take communion every week as a way to wear our faith on our sleeve. You know, Jesus commanded his disciples to do this in remembrance of me. He gave them the bread and he said this is his body which is given for them and it is given for us. And he passed the cup and he said this is the cup of the new covenant. It is my blood which is poured out for you. And he said do this in remembrance of me. Because every single time that we take communion together as a church family, we are not only being obedient to the command of Jesus, but we are declaring our faith amongst brothers and sisters of the faith, saying, we believe that Jesus did what the Father sent him to do for our sake. So I invite you to take a moment and contemplate the reality that Jesus died so that we could live this life with heart, soul, and mind. And that every time we take communion together, it is one small act where we wear our faith on our sleeve. And after that time of pausing and reflection, we will take communion together as a church family. invite you to take the bread from this cup and eat. This is his body which is given for us. And I invite you to take and drink from this cup. This is his blood which is poured out for us. Please pray with me. Dear Lord God, I thank you that uh, you not only call us to the abundant life given by grace through Jesus, but that you uh, provide us with calling uh, to be devoted and to fully devote ourselves to you and to take uh, every measure that we can uh, to be all about you with all of our being. And I pray, Lord, that uh, as we go about our lives, that we will be mindful of not only our calling, uh, but the ways that you can uh, keep us tethered to the path that you call us to. And I pray that you will just help us to uh, take those paths and make use of them so that we can always be rooted to you, that we can uh, always be mindful of your word, that we can, by the power of the Spirit, let it transform us, and so that we can really let know, let, let others know what we are about, so that we can be light and salt. Thank you for your goodness, for your grace, and for the
through the sacrifice of your son, Jesus. And it's in his name we pray.